Gary Franchi here for the Reality Report. We have now with us in studio a very special guest, Richard Gage, who is a member of the American Institute of Architects. He's also the founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Richard, welcome to the show. Thanks, Gary. Great to be here today. Now, let's talk about Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. How did the organization begin, and uh, uh, what is its purpose? Well, it began about four years ago when I heard on the radio um, uh, David Ray Griffin, uh, an author of about nine books now on the subject of 9-11. And uh, this, this was shocking to me. I'm on my way to a, a, a construction observation meeting, and I, I couldn't believe my ears. This is an, as somebody's explaining what happened to the Twin Towers that I knew nothing about. I thought it was just a gravitational collapse according to the official story. And now I'm hearing that there's beams flying out of the towers and uh, uh, landing 600 feet away with molten metal pouring off the ends of them and so forth. I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. So I did some research, um, uh, put a presentation together after that, took it to the 15 architects and engineers, uh, architects that I worked for. They thought I was nuts until I showed them uh, in this uh, conference room with pizza uh, that I had to bribe them to get them there. They all agreed with me afterwards, and they signed my petition, except for my boss, who was Middle Eastern. He was afraid to sign it. But it, that was it. That was our first 15 architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Now we have 1,500. And uh, virtually every architect and engineer who looks at this evidence is convinced. Uh, it's, it's really amazing how uh, overwhelmingly simple it is to understand and people are shocked that they didn't hear about this from our government or media. Now, uh, one thing that the American people have not seen and know very little about is a, a building known as Building 7. Uh, let's play that clip. Now, Richard, we just saw the collapse of Building 7. Could you explain what we just saw? Exactly. <laughs> because it's mind-boggling. We've all seen this before. What is it? It's exactly like, in fact, it looks like those old hotels in Las Vegas that fall uh, uniformly, symmetrically, straight down into their own footprints and where the total structure is dismembered and it collapses, therefore, like a house of cards. It's broken up and ready for loading and shipment. Now. We're told by NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, that this building, seven years later, by the way, uh, this building came down due to normal office fires in a new phenomenon never before heard called the thermal expansion. Well, now this building was not hit by a plane, right? Right. <laughs> and uh, it came down about 520 in the afternoon of 9-11. It is part of the World Trade Center disaster uh, all to, uh, Clearly, by any definition, uh, it's part of the conspiracy, if you will, of, uh, of the destruction of the World Trade Center. So uh, it has to be understood in, in that context. Uh, now, everybody knows who sees this building that it's a controlled demolition. Uh, it doesn't take rocket science to realize that a free-falling building can't, it can't, it can't destroy 40,000 tons of structural framework in it that's five times stronger than it needed to be to keep that building up. Now, what, 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 what would be required to dismember a building in that capacity? Well, since it's free-falling, uh, they would have to remove, synchronistically timed, the structural columns on each floor all at once, or at least virtually simultaneously. Fire doesn't have this precision. Uh, a controlled demolition with explosives uh, is the answer as to how this can happen. Uh, and there's evidence uh, of these incendiaries in this case. What uh, type of incendiaries would, would most likely be used? Well, we're talking about thermite because there's several tons of molten metal found underneath all three World Trade Center skyscrapers, by the way. Uh, this turns out to be molten iron. Molten iron is documented by FEMA in the steel 
as, as well as the evaporation of the ends of these beams. Hot sulfur corrosion attack. Sulfur is added to thermite to become thermate. It's much more effective. Thermite issues molten iron as its byproduct. FEMA documents molten iron and the ends of these beams invading the grain boundaries, in fact, of the steel. So we have the documentation from FEMA, which NIST threw out and did not incorporate in their final report. So this is extremely important. All of this evidence is really quite clear, the way it adds up to become, uh, to, to support the hypothesis of controlled demolition, which NIST never looked at. They said, oh, there would have been, been a huge bomb going off. Well, no, we're talking about incendiaries here. They don't have the loud bangs of C4 or RDX, typical high energy explosives. They don't have the bright flashes. This is a deceptive controlled demolition. Now, I understand that there has been some uh, dust analyzed uh, from uh, the, the debris of the Twin Towers and Building 7. Uh, could you talk to us a little bit about what was discovered in that dust? Well, that dust is 30% concrete uh, by the USGS, who analyzes it. Um, and, and it's a fine, uh, almost like talcum powder, laid throughout lower Manhattan in a 12-inch thick blanket in, in some areas. And it's being, pull, it's, it's being created in mid-air, before the towers come down. Pulverized concrete, 90,000 tons of it, in the 110 floors that are missing down at the bottom of each of these twin towers. Uh, not only that, 10,000 file cabinets, over 1,000 people. There's no trace of whatsoever. And, and so, except for 700 bone fragments found uh, that are about a half an inch long on top of the skyscraper. But in this dust, officials, USGS, finds uh, billions of small uh, microspheres of previously molten iron. That is also proof of temperatures sustained over 2,700 degrees. Now, jet fuel and office fires don't create those temperatures. <coughs> they don't even create half those temperatures. So what are these small spheres of iron uh, doing in all the World Trade Center dust. Well, if there was thousands of thermite cutter charges throughout the columns and beams in these buildings, under explosive conditions, it would be atomized, the liquid molten iron byproduct, and it would fall and cool uh, as spheres with all of the dust. That's the only rational explanation for these spheres being in all the World Trade Center dust. Now, an international team of scientists also finds small red-grade chips in the dust. These turn out to be nanothermite composite explosives because there's extremely small particles. So they've actually, they've actually discovered, they've found in the dust the, the, the non-detonated explosive charges. Yeah, well, we can call them incendiaries that are designed to be explosives because of the extremely small size, nanoscale aluminum oxide and iron, iron oxide and aluminum powders that are intimately mixed and in the perfect proportion in these red-gray chips to become thermite. But because of their size, they can be engineered to become explosive. Well, now being an architect yourself, you're traditionally building uh, structures and, and designing structures. Uh, what is necessary, uh, in, in what fashion would incendiary devices need to be positioned uh, inside a building? How long does, does it take to uh, to place these incendiary devices inside a building. I mean, we're talking 110-story, 100, 210-story buildings, and of course, Building Seven. We're, this is a, a, a mammoth um, situation. I, 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 I just can't fathom what it would take. Talk to us about how 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 that uh, how the charges could have been placed. Well, easily these. Uh were the largest controlled demolitions in history. The towers being a very explosive event, not a very controlled event actually at all, uh, versus the, the, the implosion of World Trade Center 7. Um, but it would so, take so, months. So, so, built, so the first two towers are, are, were more explosive? Oh yeah, 98% of the debris, the core columns are, and, and perimeter columns are blown outside the footprint. You know, with, with, again, no floors found there and very... And, and Building 7, it was an implosion. The, 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 the building came, caved in on right. itself. Yeah, very classic uh, controlled demolition using uh, thermite in, uh, in, in that case and probably nanothermite 
uh, which is a more explosive incendiary, which is, can be a contradiction in terms uh, until you really understand and do some more research in this peer-reviewed paper, which documents um, the, the, the findings of this international team led by Niels Herrett into the nanothermite capabilities. It can become more explosive. It's set in an organic bed of iron, oxygen, silica, which can do the gas overpressure work. So that's very important. Uh, but to answer your other question, how 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 long does it take to put who, how long does it take to put these things together? I mean, those buildings came down like like that, like a snap of your finger, they were gone. Well, in about a dozen seconds for for the towers, and uh, six and a half seconds for Building Seven. Uh, this is we're talking free fall in case of Building Seven and near free fall, two thirds of free fall. That building's going faster and faster down. Uh, there's nothing almost nothing resisting it. There's 80,000 tons of structural steel. Now, how would they have gotten in there past the, all the occupants to plant those explosives? Well, in the elevator shafts, uh, where there are no occupants uh, above and below the elevator cabs, uh, somebody could have planted uh, those explosives, uh, a group of uh, a team, a large team, acting over a period of months. Um, and an elevator modernization would have given the perfect cover. And in fact, that's exactly what we had in the Twin Towers, the largest elevator modernization in history. Now, this is documented in 2000, uh, March of 2000, Elevator World. And uh, this, is, this would have given the perfect cover to plant these explosives. March of 2000 is when the elevator, elevators were reconditioned? For the nine months prior to 9-11, those elevators were under modernization by Ace Elevator. So we want an investigation of Ace Elevator, who had 85 employees at the time the first jet hit, and they scattered. They left. It was, it was a scandal. And USA Today documented this uh, shortly after 9-11. Uh, they're supposed to stay around and, and help. They're experts in the delivery systems. Uh, uh, the, the, the elevators to help the fire first responders. So where, where is Ace Elevator now? Well, they went out of business shortly after that, and I understand they're, they're back in business again. Interesting, interesting. Now, let's talk about people getting active with uh, architects and engineers. You have uh, over 1,500 architects? Yeah, indeed, and we're, we're growing uh, rapidly, and others are helping us too. We do have action groups. Um, uh, we're we, uh, over two dozen now, and we're growing to 200 to 300 action groups all across the country where local 9-11 uh, truth groups uh, can affiliate with us just by going to take action on our website, which is ae911truth.org. Uh, take action, uh, join an action group. Um, uh, we'll put your... Um, uh, their uh, website and email address on our, uh, uh, on our website and then people can call them locally and all across the country and around the world and we'll coordinate. Every month we're on a conference call and we coordinate local action so we're all doing the same thing in concert which can be very powerful. Uh, what is the, the overall uh, public response? I know you've gone on several tours around the country. Uh, what is the overall response from people hearing uh, your presentation? Well, it certainly ranges. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, we've got a very positive response to the evidence itself. Uh, as far as the media, uh, we, we have a tough time getting the mainstream media to show up to these events. Although we're doing a radio interview now about every day, um, and, and TV interviews once in a while, these are not big mainstream national audiences. Uh, that's uh, the, the gold prize. We were on Geraldo uh, with one of our engineers, Tony Zambodi, and a family member, which was very helpful in November. We haven't had much follow-up yet. Now, that was in relation to the Building What campaign. Uh-huh. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, and this is uh, a, an extraordinary effort uh, by uh, NYC CAN, New York City Coalition for Accountability Now. Uh, the Remember Building 7 project puts $100,000 worth of TV ads to the New York public uh, in an effort to educate them and the city council that Building 7 does, in fact, come down in the exact manner of a pl classic controlled demolition. It requires a reinvestigation of it because we're told it came down by, this, by fire. And so uh, this, this effort is ongoing and extremely important. All right, folks, that was Richard Gage. Take action with him at ae911truth.org. We'll see you again.